Okay. Hello, my name is Avni. I'm a full-time uh, member of the LaRouche organization in Canada, out of Montreal, where our headquarters are. And uh, I'm going to go through something very important, a very important milestone in mankind's history, which was the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. And why this basically established an idea, a concept of a nation, of a country for the first time somewhat effectually before the American Revolution finally realized it more fully. But this, this idea of a sovereign nation and of a sovereign nation being responsible for its own actions was not violated so openly till, till now, till you saw Libya, Syria, so on, so blatant violation of it. The problem was that when, when this violation occurred, very few people around the world, very few leaders understood that why this is such a big deal. Why is it that when Tony Blair attacked Westphalia in 1990s, like a year before 9-11, what's the big deal? Okay, so we need a global community. But, and it was only LaRouche, it was only our organization that really understood what's being attacked here. And that's what I'm gonna go through my class, is what, what was Westphalia? Because the, John F. Kennedy, in one of his televised speeches, said at one point that you know we have the opportunity of becoming the best nation the, the best generation or the last generation and this is not i mean this is this is this is jfk this is not larouche although larouche is the only one ever since who has said that now w the best generation means that you that you take on the mission for humanity you are responsible for giving your nation your humanity a real mission the problem today is a lot of people don't think that way. You know, when, when the Dow goes down 0.5%, it's national headlines. But the fact that 9,000 children starve in sub-Sahara Africa every day, half a million children starve or, or they die in India every year, this is not national headlines. You don't have people cringe to that. You don't have, oh my God, that's terrible, we should do something. Now, why do these half a million children die? Because there's no soap. They lack soap. So how are you going to change the situation? Are you going to give them soap? No, you need to improve the edu you need to improve the culture, the whole economic infrastructure. You need to increase the relative population per density, what LaRouche talks about. That's how you change the paradigm right now. That's, that's the mission right now which we have adopted, which, which is the basis of our movement in the United States, Canada, and 20 different nations around the world. This is what we do. And right now, our, right now, the eyes of the world are on the United States. What are you going to do? What are the Americans going to do? Do they realize what's at stake? And do they realize they have the power to change the situation? And I can tell you, every, every, every thinking person in the world is looking to the United States to act. This is a very big responsibility. And I hope my class helps you understand why we have the authority. It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not something that cannot be done. It has been done. And this is actually something the United States used to do, not, under, not just under John F. Kennedy, but way back even the founding, you know, the founding fathers, but then especially under John Quincy Adams, which LaRouche called last week the golden age of America. Because under John Quincy Adams, not as president, but under Monroe, what he drafted pretty much was the Monroe Doctrine, was an idea that we are gonna, we're gonna take responsibility for the development of South American nations and colonies. You may be a colony, but we're, we're gonna ensure that you are, you are treated fairly as a human being, as a sovereign culture. So we're gonna prevent the British Empire from looting you, from raping fr your, your, your resources and so on. That, in, in very broad brush strokes was the Monroe Doctrine. And, uh, but this idea, this, the concept of a nation, of protecting a nation, of that of the general welfare being more important than profit, this, was, this did, did not just come from John Quincy Adams' mind or the Founding Fathers' mind. This, this came from Europe. This came from the Treaty of Westphalia. And even before that, this came from Cusa, which I'll go in later. But 
This is very important because, you know, if you look at the Nuremberg uh, tribunals, when the Nazis were tried, they, they were tried for war crimes and other crimes, killing the Jews was like number four or five, not higher than that. The number one crime was invasion of other nations, of violating international treaty, violating the nation's uh, sovereignty. That was the number one issue. That, that, that's because that as a principle is much more important. And that's why when you meet any liberal idiot on the street who says, well, I don't see Obama killing Jews, you know, tell them what, what, well, that's not exactly what we tried the Nazis for actually. That was not the number one criteria. The number one criteria is violating the general welfare, violating human rights. That's it. That's what, that's what United States has been doing over the past decade. Okay, so, so we come to the 30 years war. You know, because the, the problem today is that the Treaty of Westphalia is called as, if you, if you study it in universities, it's, called, it's taught as the, treat, the, the peace of exhaustion. That everybody just got exhausted of fighting for decades, and they said, well, can't we just find a way to get along? You know, I don't have any army anymore, and we don't have any food, and, but that's not what happened, because that would have happened much earlier. Because these, although they're called the 30 years war, they, were, they had been going on in one for fashion or the other since about 100 years. Just like you can say, World War I never really ended. I mean, except for a decade here or a few years here, the world has been con continuously at war ever since the past 100 years. And that's exactly what you had in 1500s till 1600s. And so you had, but, but with, the, with, the, with the Treaty of Westphalia, what, what came before was, you know, you had you had villages which were completely decimated of population. You had, like this is, this is, you know, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France, and all the red and purple areas are population areas where the population dropped 50%. And the rest of the areas are much less. In many of these regions all over Europe, it took the, these villages about 100 years to get their population back up to their original levels pre-Westphalian levels. And so you had many of these villages where you wouldn't find any men, only women and babies, you know? And, and it's not just people were dying in battle. That's not where, that's, that, that's the funny thing because people weren't just, it wasn't just because people are dying fighting each other. You had a complete collapse of civilization because when all the men are fighting, who's gonna grow the crops? Who's gonna cultivate? Who's gonna tend to the farms? Who's gonna, you know, cause you need to, continuously build a civilization, roads, agriculture, shipping, all that. None of that was happening. So you had people who died of plague, diseases, and just neglect. Infant mortality rate was through the roof. One in your 20 children survived on average. That's what's happening today. That's the United States mortality rate for women. If you look at the, the red areas are the, the regions where more women are dying than you know, the mortality rate of the death rate among women is increasing, often through birth, you know, uh, giving birth and, or, or after birth and so on and so forth. But this, this is, this is 1600s, this, but this is the present in the United States. So, so the point was you had, you had in Europe emerge a, uh, a strong, very small, but a very intellectually strong force against this crap. And one of the people who, who led it was this guy, Mazarin. He was a cardinal, so he was a priest. You know, much like Cusa, who was also in the church. But these guys weren't just praying. These guys were actually politically active. They were actually organizing a leadership across Europe to get away from the dark age and to create an alliance based on progress. So they, the two of the main people who led the whole thing was Mazarin and this young guy, uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Colbert was a very prominent figure and they were in France, they were out of Paris. And they, like Mazarin was the tutor of Louis XIV, who was at that time, like he, he basically started tutoring the, the emperor since he was a child. 
the emperor wasn't that sharp, but because he was under strong guide, guidance and a strong leadership, you know, he took, France took on the role of pushing the Treaty of Westphalia. And this is something which culminated, you know, in 1648, where many of the opposing forces came together and signed the treaty. And, but, but this wasn't just, you know, one day affair. Because the, the, the collaboration and the dialogue had begun for about a decade before. But what were they talking about? They were talking about this guy, Cusa, the real precursor to the Renaissance, the real precursor to the idea of this idea of, you know, of, build, of having a nation without the divine right of kings. That you can have a republic, that you, that, that the idea that every man is created in the image of God. And he wrote many books on learned, learned ignorance and so on and so forth. And these books weren't just nice books, they were being discussed by the topmost intellectuals in Europe, forcing them to change their identity, forcing them to realize that, you know, that, yeah, that this actually makes sense. That the idea of a man created in the image of God is actually very, very important concept in changing anything. But what does that mean, you know? That doesn't mean, you know, Jesus walks on water, so you walk on water. It's, it's not superpowers. Man is created in the image of God through the mind, through his thinking, that through his thought, he can actually change the universe. He can actually change his surrounding nature. So, Kuza's writings were very important, and what was, so, you know, I mean, there was no mass communication. So if you want to have a dialogue, if you want to, you know, uh, Mazarin was sending people all over Europe, uh, so, and, and in an age without mass communication, it was, uh, it was quite work, because it took a month to get a letter anywhere, and then it took another month to get the letter back. In the meantime, your horse may may get tired or your horsemen may get shot and so on and so forth. I mean, this was quite a tedious affair, but they still did it. And in 1648, you had the signing of a treaty, of the treaty, which meant, which, had, which is actually, we're going to read two articles from it. Who wants to read? Uh, up top or the article one? From the top. The Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, bringing an end to the Thirty Years' War, which had drowned Europe in blood and battles over religion, defined the principles of and equality in numerous subcontracts. Is there a word missing? Oh, s principles of sovereignty. Oh. Sorry. <clears throat> so the treaty defined principles of sovereignty and equality in numerous subcontracts. And in this way it became the constitution of the new system of states in Europe. We quote the two key principles. Article one begins, a Christian general and permanent peace and true and honest friendship must rule between the holy imperial majesty and the holy all Christian majesty, as well as between all and every ally and follower of the mentioned imperial majesty, the house of Austria and successors. And this peace must be so honest and seriously guarded and nourished that each part furthers the advantage, honor, and benefit of the other. A faithful neighborliness should be renewed and flourish for peace and friendship and flourish again. Peace among sovereign nations requires, in other words, according to this principle, that each nation develops itself fully and regards it as its self-interest to develop the others fully, and vice versa. A real family of nations. Right. So your advantage lies in the advantage of the other. You have to see the challenge of seeing yourself in, in another person, in your enemy. You know, seeing a human being in a Nazi, it's not the easiest thing, but it's there somewhere. But, but that was the idea that you are your own worst enemy. That if you want to fight real, real evil in, in the world, it's not going to be by killing another human being. It has, you have to seek the advantage of the other to kill an evil. It's a pretty, high, it's a pretty hard concept. But you want to keep reading Article 2? Sure. Article 2 says, 
on both sides, all should be forever forgotten and forgiven. What has from the beginning of the unrest, no matter how or where, from one side or the other, happened in terms of hostility, so that neither because of that nor for any other reason or pretext should anyone commit or allow to happen any hostility, unfriendliness, difficulty, or obstacle in respect to persons, their status, goods, or security itself, or through others, secretly or openly, directly or indirectly, under the pretense of the authority of the law, or by way of violence within the kingdom, or anywhere outside of it. And any earlier contradictory treaties should not stand against this. Instead, the fact that each and everyone, from one side and the other, both before and during the war, committed insults, violent acts, hostilities, damages, and injuries, without regard to persons or outcomes, should be completely put aside, so that everything, whatever one could demand from another under his name, will be forgotten to eternity. OK, so the idea of the past does not govern the future. Your past actions are in no way going to uh, help you reach your conclusion towards a better future, towards any future. So that was really key of forgiving your enemy completely, no holds barred. That's, that's how you have a real alliance, because that's how you, they, un, they succeeded in undermining an empire, which basically succeeds by divide and conquer, by always working on somebody's vice or somebody's weakness. But when you have an idea of an alliance of nations in the advantage of the other, no matter what, that, that's not what you have today. That's not the intention of Obama. Period. Ukraine, the government is good or wrong, the opposition is Nazi or not. The intention of Obama, of Victoria Nuland, Tony Blair, has never been honest. They don't have a right to go into Afghanistan or Iraq or any country and say, oh, we're here to protect you. We're going to protect your population. We're going to save you from Saddam or Assad or Musharraf or whatever. No, because they never, they never really cared. Where were, where were you? Where was London when these people were starving, when Iraq was begging for, for, for grain at the, world, at the IMF or the United Nations? When these third world nations were begging for nuclear energy in the 1970s, what did these guys do then? No. So what gives them the authority now to be the champions of, of peace and liberty? So this is really important because that's, that's pretty much the fundamental principle by which you judge. The, because, yeah, the Ukrainian government, they are, made up, they are corrupt. They are not the best people you would want. But you definitely don't want the empire in there. So this was the Westphalia. I mean, there's a lot of articles. These are just two articles in it which, give, which should give people an idea. This was completely revolutionary. This was, this was not easily done, but it happened. And then, and so it, I mean, it really challenged the whole idea of an empire, you know, which exists by killing people, by treating people like slaves, whether the Boston Massacre or India or Ireland, or, or anywhere else in Africa. The idea that the world is fixed, and I'll come back to that later because that's what they actually say. That the, the, in their mind, the world is fixed. You can't change it. You can't change Africa. You can't develop these people. You can't you can develop Afghanistan. You, know, you, can, you can never solve poverty. But that's not what Westphalia had said. The idea is that man is created in the image of God, and when people when you have a leadership that understands that principle, you have breakthroughs made. Now, the problem is that that wasn't all. It wasn't that people came together, signed a document, everybody can go home and we can drink some wine. There was actually the real work had to be done. That now, OK, now that we have an alliance, we can actually, we can actually figure out how to build a future. And the funny thing was that it, at that time, before 1640s, people even didn't People had no idea what Europe looked like. Like the, I, the idea of a longitude, you know, the, a map is divided into latitudes and longitudes. The idea of a longitude came after Westphalia. It was developed after Westphalia in France due to Colbert's reforms. So people really had no concept of, of a Europe. Just like people today don't have a concept of the world or the solar system. They can't even name the nine planets in order. And they, have, they want to go into Ukraine and topple the government. They probably couldn't even point, 
you know, point Ukraine on a map a year ago. And, and, and so, so the idea of, you know, the, the way Mazarin, Colbert recruited leadership all over Europe was by recognizing that, hey, we have a lot of potential along the Rhine or the Danube, the Vistula, the, old, the other rivers that we can actually, you know, work on these river systems, develop them. Because the point was, especially the Rhine, I mean, most of the battles were fought for the Rhine, the control of the Rhine, that whoever controls the Rhine controls Europe, because this was a major navig navigable river. You know, it had a port, you could, you could then take your, you know, trade with the rest of the world. And this, the, the region around the Rhine was very fertile, not just for crops, but also for ores and stuff, which is why this region was, I mean, World War II, it was the Versailles Treaty. The Rhine Valley was the biggest thing, the, the area which was given, taken away from the Germans and which led to their depression, but that's another thing. But the point is this region, the control of this region determined, determined authority. But that's, that's what Westphalia challenged because Westphalia challenged that no, power does not come from authority. That was a big, that your, just because you own the land doesn't make you the authority, does not make you the decider of the destiny of your people. You know, and so what, and so what these people would do because all, you had all these little kingdoms and all these little dukedoms all over the Rhine and these people would, you know, tax the shit out of people if they want to go through the Rhine. So you have no economy because the idea is, well, if you want to make money, it's like today. If you, if you want to make money, you got to, if you want to make profit, you got to steal. The idea that, well, if you're making, if, if you're making money, somebody's getting poor, right? You're, you're taking it from somewhere if you're making money. That was what was happening back then. The, the idea that, okay, if we want to make money, we got to tax people or we got to steal from people. That's what West, Westphalia challenged, that no, free trade is not how you're going to change the world. Free trade is not how you're going to build Europe. And what Westphalia brought forward was fair trade, that we're going to reduce the taxes, we're going to improve the population's capability of, of, of labor, of producing, and of mining ores. But this is what is pretty good. Who wants to read? I don't like reading. Do you want to read? You should read. I need a volume. Okay, you want to read? Sure. Fair trade on Europe's rivers. In 1642, Mazarin summoned his negotiators at Munster to announce and circulate everywhere that the precondition of the peace negotiations was to forbid the creation of new coal along the Rhine River. Proposition was written as follows. From this day forward, along the two banks of the Rhine River and from the adjacent provinces, commerce and transport of goods shall be free of canvas for all of the inhabitants. They will no longer be permitted to impose on the Rhine any new toll, open birthright, customs, or taxation of any denomination and of any sort whatsoever. The fact that the injunction included the mention, parentheses, I mean, uh, quotations, and from the adjacent provinces, proposed to bring fair trade and economic expansion deeper into the heart of Germany. Right. So the, the authority and the control of Rhine is not just for the people there, but it's for the adjacent regions. It's for, it's for the benefit of everyone. The idea of general welfare, you know, so this was really key for, for later on for the United States to understand. But so now, I mean, now, I mean, through this treaty and through Colbert's reforms, you had you had some real, really important work done, because Colbert was the one who he was like the Alexander Hamilton. He was the young, bright guy who had the motivation and the guts and the and a certain authority uh, and an opportunity, but also, you know, uh, mentors, really serious mentors like um, Mazarin and uh, Pierre Fermat, who was a very famous scientist. These guys taught and, and they, they taught at Colbert and Colbert listened to them and was their student for all his life. But Colbert, uh, 
push this idea for the first time of fair trade versus free trade. And even to this day in university campuses, the idea of Colbertism or dirigism or coal bear trade or coal bear e economy is hated. People hate it. London School of Economics attacks it to the day. And, and, but this is, what, this is what made Europe. This is why Europe, to even till day, has not been able to, you know, is still surviving on the reforms Colbert did. Because it wasn't just the treaty, it was a lot of reforms, especially this thing, the industrial commonwealth policy. Because what, what Colbert launched was, okay, we're gonna now use the opportunity to put people to work, to put people to work for, for building dams, for constructing river, riverways, for major agricultural projects. I mean, the scale of TVA. I mean, this thing in the industrial commonwealth policies were like the Tennessee Valley Authority policies of that day. And I want somebody to read. Somebody else wants to volunteer? You want to read? OK. Why don't you read? The industrial commonwealth policy. Colbert's industrial protectionist system is generally known for four major reforms that marked the beginnings of the modern industrial nation state. First, he organized and funded a system of industrial corporations and infrastructure projects that provided job security for all types of skilled and non-skilled labor, that is, workers of all types of arts and men. Yeah. Does that mean? I don't know. Secondly, he established protectionist measures for all standardized French clothing products, such that no dumping of foreign goods was allowed in France, except at very high cost. Colbertism became synonymous with protectionism. Third, he funded and supported population growth, considering that war and ignorance were the two main causes of population reduction. He believed that the government had to take care of its poor and that its role was to foster the increase of the population density of the nation. And fourth, he accompanied industrial measures with a reform of civil justice that became the first civil code of France, lasting 130 years until it was destroyed by the imperialist code of Napoleon at the turn of the 18th century. Right. And this was never changed again. I mean, the idea of justice of the civil laws that Colbert laid out they were never, uh, they were taken down in 1800s, late 1700s. They were really never brought back again. The current French law is certain modification of the Napoleon law, but it's not what Colbert did, had done for 130 years. But this idea, you know, population growth being the main focus, it's not just churning out babies, because the idea is we're going to create skill, a skilled population. This was really important. And the other thing, you know, the number one, that, that every kind of worker, every kind of work, every kind of art, every kind of skill is important to the nation. That you have to, the idea, the metaphor being like, you've got to think about the whole farm. You can't just think about the benefit of the sheep or the cows or the chicken. The whole farm, what's good for everyone is good, is good for any part. So this idea of, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna build a whole nation this was really important because before Colbert, every law, any, any law would be made by the, their, the people. Like, like today, Wall Street makes banking law. It's, it's ridiculous, you know? It's the government that should make the banking law or, or you know, the insurance companies make the healthcare law. So, which, which leads to conflict of interest, which is what Colbert had done, that no, we need, we need, to, make a, we need to make a law which is in the benefit of everyone. So even if it means that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna stop the dumping of foreign goods in our shores, okay. But we, because we have a right and a duty to protect our population and to increase their, their benefit. So this is what he had done. During the 1660s, there persisted a three century old privilege that dated back to the shameful 1358 edict of Charles V that stated that the laws of commerce are made to profit and favor each craft rather than the common good. Colbert turned this on its head, instituting his first edict on April 8, 1666. 
which was made to secure all of the manufacturers and factories of the kingdom for the benefit of the common good. From that day on, Colbert wrote hundreds of measures and regulations until the entire garden of France began to bloom again after the, after the devastation of the religious wars. Right. But Colbert, he held many positions during his uh, uh, work, his life which today you would compare to like the finance minister, secretary of war, secretary of state, foreign minister. He held all these positions for many years uh, at one time or the other. But the problem was that when Colbert was brought in, when he first started doing this, people, nobody really trusted him. The general population said, yeah, that's fine and good, but you know, this is not gonna last. The typical what you have today, you know, well, yeah, you want to impeach Obama, that's great, but it'll never happen, you know. So that was the, so Colbert had to really prove, just like, you know, yeah, well, he had to really show people that he meant business. He had to show the oligarchy he means business. One of the biggest scandals, therefore, what he did intentionally was the Fouquet affair. Fouquet, the guy on the right, was the finance minister of France. He was a very close friend of the king, of the emperor. Colbert put this guy on trial for embezzlement of state funds, and he was thrown in exile. He, 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 he basically had to beg to not be hanged, and he was thrown in exile for the rest of his life. And so, but this scandal, which was like, I mean, this is like throwing J Jamie Dimon in jail. This, is, this happened. We did this. So Colbert's reform, I mean, the Fouquet affair was a big, big national headline that the population really started believing him. Want to read? Sure. Colbert's reform of justice. The most famous example of abuse of public trust during that period was known as the Fouquet affair, the scandalous case of the superintendent of the finances of King Louis XIV. In November of 1661, Colbert forced Nicolas Fouquet to be brought before the tribunal for having stolen an immense fortune from different public offices and from the treasury of the king. In 1661, the government brought him to trial where he was found guilty of massive embezzlement. All of his goods were confiscated. He was condemned to exile and then later imprisoned for life, imprisoned for life in the fortress of Pignerol. Yeah, there's an island in the middle of nowhere. But I mean, this guy had, he had palaces. He was the finance minister for many years. He was nobility. Because another thing, in France at that time, and I think in other regions also around that time, but France, you had the tradition of buying public offices. If you would have a finance minister or any official post, would, you wouldn't have elections. You would have the nobility give lots of money to buy an office which actually also happens in Britain today. That's how the House of Lords is filled. You can buy a seat on the House of Lords. That doesn't happen in the United States Senate. Well, that's how we're getting our ambassadors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it happens, you know, in the black. It happens in secret, but this was out in the open. This was considered natural. There was a, there, you know, there was a, there used to be a saying that every time the king creates an office, some idiot stands up to buy it. But the idea, the, this is funny, but the problem was there was a big problem attacking this. There was a big problem attacking these people because these people were stealing to the tune of millions. You know, if, today, like, UK had palaces. These people had palaces. But it was considered that, oh, you can't target these people. You know, why would they steal? They give, they give so much money. No, they give so much money to serve people. Yeah, they give so much money to, to, to help the state. They work so hard. They've got s such an important job. But that's how people treat Wall Street. You know, why would they steal? You know, they're in charge of our money. If they steal, they would lose our trust, right? So why, why would Wall Street want to steal? Yes? Well, we're going to, I'm not done with the reforms yet. I'm not done with my class yet. No, I'm not going to get to that.
Well, that's a whole different story. We can talk about that later, but that would take me completely <laughs> off topic. The focus here is the Westphalia, that this, this did happen. Although it fell apart, it fell apart not because of any problems in itself, any weakness in its own principle. It fell apart because you, had, you have an oligarchy. You've had a continuous struggle since mankind's creation of Zeus versus Prometheus. That's why it fell apart, but not from any weakness or from any, 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 anything wrong with, with the concept, with, the, with, this, with this principle. So the idea was, you know, that yeah, you can target these people, you can touch them, they're, they're untouchable, they would never steal. You know, like the AIG, the bank CEO, he gave an interview uh, two years ago, he said that targeting Wall Street bonuses is like lynching Negroes in the South. He actually gave it, so that was the, the AIG CEO, yeah. So, so basically, after after Colbert's uh, Fouquet affair, what he launched was something like the Pecora Commission. That it's not just Fouquet; it's going to be everyone. It's going to be everybody. Everybody's got to open their books and show me what you owe, own is actually yours. How many people don't know Pecora? Like you know, Colbert's Pecora Commission. Does do people know who Pecora is? Okay, well, for people who do not know, Ferdinand Pecora, who's the guy on the left, he, this is him on Time Magazine versus Ben Bernanke on the Time Magazine. But Ferdinand Pecora was actually an Italian, the son of Italian immigrants. He actually led an investigative committee to investigate the crimes of Wall Street. This commi the, the, the report that Pecora created was called the Pecora Commission. This report, which proved that Wall Street had been intentionally stealing from people and knew about the collapse, this was a big push in Glass-Steagall. This was a big push in shutting up opposition. And what happened was JP Morgan was put on trial. This really scared the shit out of bankers. Colbert did that. You know, what Colbert launched was a really a coup against the oligarchy. A coup d'etat against the oligarchy, Colbert's Pecora Commission. In March of 1661, the 23-year-old King Louis XIV replaced Nicolas Fouquet with Colbert as the superintendent of finances. After the scandalous trial of Fouquet was over, Colbert became a popular hero and was given the green light for the creation of a chamber of justice. In all, 27 judges were commissioned by Colbert to clean up the biggest financial mess the nation had ever seen. The reforms were so sweeping that in only a few years, a total of 419 million pounds was recovered from the income of penal offices. And no fewer than 40,000 noble families were affected by this dramatic <laughs> change. All of those funds were then invested in Colbert's program of development of new industries. Right. So this was, this was very important, but this showed people Colbert means business. Colbert showed everybody else I mean business. And, and you know, but it wasn't just, it, it, that was not all. There was much, much more. The, the biggest thing that he did, the, one of the biggest Westphalian ideas and revolutions was the Royal Academy of Sciences. The idea that we're going to create a leadership among scientists. We're going to bring together scientists from all over Europe. And this is what Colbert did because Louis XIV, the emperor, he's a young guy. He was 24. And he wasn't serious. He wasn't as sublime as Colbert. You know, he was, he was a playboy. He was easy to go young guy he was like why do we have to take on the responsibility for mankind why can't I just party <laughs> why can't I just play <laughs> but you had Mazarin and Colbert saying no this this has to happen or else there is no play we're all gonna die <laughs> so so you had after much persuasion and an academy was set up to bring in the best minds of around Europe these were not just political figures these were hardcore scientists and geniuses. People like, well, I'll show what people, but you want to read? The Royal Academy of Sciences. This was not just another academic teaching institution, but rather a research center for scientific and technological development that had the mission of creating innovations and specific
specific areas of scientific activities to improve economic development in the fields of astronomy, chemistry, optical physics, geometry, geography, industrial engineering, canal building, agriculture, and navigation. Each area was to be oriented toward technological advances through the application of new discoveries of physical principles. This Colbertian Academy of Sciences became the model institution from which Gottfried Leibniz later created his academies in Berlin and St. Petersburg. Right. So this wasn't just a university. This was the hub of, we're going to make breakthroughs. We're going to make breakthroughs in optical physics, in, op in, in, in geography, in map making, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we're going to put them to use. Because France at that time was going through a big industrial revolution, was going through a lot of work in, that, in the agriculture and, and industrial sector. So this is like, this is like pu putting to NASA together. This is like putting the team that's going to build NAWAPA. You know, because, and this painting is a, is a, it's, it's a small section of a bigger painting, which is in the Louvre in, in Paris. So next time you go to Paris, Remember to look it up. But this is a painting of you know Colbert and all these scientists presenting themselves to the emperor, Louis XIV. And, and this is another painting of the scale, because the building was magnificent. It was Greek architecture. And this is a sketch of the whole thing being built, which itself required the best minds to come forward to you know ar architects and so on to really bring back the Renaissance, bring back the Greek, the, the, the Plato school of, of science. So, and the building was burned down, I think, 100, 200 years later. But it was beautiful. You can take my word for it. <laughs> it was worth, worth the sight. But, you know, you had people like Christian Huygens, the top left. He was a young guy, but he made brilliant, I mean, he's very important in physics today, in mathematics. Blaise Pascal, uh, Ole, uh, you, you had a, um, uh, Ole Romer, the guy who discovered the long, or who in, I don't know, how would you call the longitude, discovery or invention? It's an invention, yeah. There's no lines in there. I know. Oh. Yeah, so invented the longitude, and uh, Blaise, uh, you know, a peer for Ma on the top left, this, he was brought in, and the main picture which I should have put up is Leibniz. Leibniz, the young guy at that time, was brought in, among these geniuses, you know, blew his mind away. And then who used this concept many decades later to build the Academy of Sciences in Berlin, in St. Petersburg. And then, you know, Vernadsky did the same in Ukraine and in other parts of Europe too. But uh, this was really, really important. And, and, the, and so by this time, France had done a lot of work in building itself up, in helping build the rest of Europe up to a to a real, you know, really understanding the concept of sovereignty, because now you have inc an increase in population, plus most of your, all your population is well-fed. Many of them are thinking, are literate. They all have jobs, which are real jobs. They're not, they're not, you know, street robbers or prostitutes or fighting a war in a foreign country. They actually are involved in building a future. And then the leadership of your regions is actually an intellectual, bunch of intellectuals who are involved in deep breakthroughs in science, philosophy, like Leibniz and so on. So this is what Westphalia had done. This is the, this is the idea of Westphalia, if an idea of you know, sovereignty, which is, I mean, a sovereign nation, it's, it's just a, no, it's a noetic principle, it's a human principle. Because also one of the major things is, uh, in, in the Westphalian articles was raison d'etre which in French, when you translate it into English, means the reason of existence. Why do you exist? You exist for the advantage of the others, but why do you exist? Why are you so important? This idea was very important in challenging the intellectuals because that's what people have to realize. One of the biggest problems is that, you know, we blow up if, if, if United States ceases to exist or Russia ceases to exist. Or if humanity ceases to exist, if you have a thermonuclear extension, would the universe lose anything? Are we important? 
Do we have a role to play? I mean, this, that, that to a lot of people should be a real existential crisis that we can't afford to, to lose humanity. But, and this is what a lot of these people who got on board with Mazarin went through, a real crisis, existential crisis, that what's the reason of our existence? Why are we fighting? Why am I fighting? So this was really important because, because that's something that today most people don't understand. And you know what you had was France, Colbert really challenged the British, the British Empire, the Venetian Empire. It was at that point because the Venice, Venice was it was pissed because as you know all these colonies were breaking up and they were losing their people and they would not fight wars anymore. They said, well, we don't want to fight anymore. We want to go with Mazarin and build this Treaty of Westphalia. We want to work with the French. So what you had was through, through organizing these regions on a higher principle, this completely undermined the empire's power. That's how, you, that's how the empire lost because the population was organized to realize, well, we don't have to serve an empire. They're, the idea of a divine right of kings, bullshit. That's exactly, I mean, but that's what, you know, that's what the British Empire, the, the British monarchy, the idea of why are you a king and I'm not a king, it comes from the divine right of kings, comes from direct, you know, he, you, he, you, you got your kingship from God. Yeah, you were ordained by God to be a king. Bloodline. And you, you can only have kings when the bloodline proceeds in the future. So what you had was a big, Colbert had to wage a really serious battle with Venice. And you know, so you had these, Colbert had a younger brother called Charles, Charles Colbert, who would be, who, he was a, like an ambassador to other regions. So he would be Colbert's right hand man. So they would have all these letters which are published, exchanging views and stuff. And one of their letters is that, you know, the British are pissed because uh, we are challenging their authority on the ocean. And so, this is really a good ex excerpt from one of the letters. Uh, you want to read it? Continental challenge to the sea powers. In a letter dated July 21, 1669, Colbert wrote his brother a note in which he stated, as far as the ocean is concerned, even though they, the British, are the more powerful, we have not until now come to the view that their pretended sovereignty has been recognized. Therefore, it pertains to the common good of the two nations and of the interests of the two kings to establish this parity on all of the seas. As for the Treaty on Commerce, the ideas of Lord Arlington are very reasonable since they tend to establish a reciprocal treatment between the two kingdoms. Right, because Britain was, the British were like, well, if you want to trade around the world, go ahead, but you got to pay us a tax because we own the ocean. Right, it's like it's like the United States telling uh, China, you can go on the moon, but you got to pay us a tax because we were there first. You know, all the all the region between Earth and Mars, you got to pay us a tax. Yes. I don't know that. I have an article that I've printed out for people to take. It's also on our website. That's very extensive. You can, I think that would go through that, but I'm not sure. The it. Yeah, it's the Economic uh, Treaty of Westphalia. People can take it afterwards. But the British, I mean, they, and Colbert was very, you know, he held his ground. He said, no, we're not going to do that. You have no authority. And it ultimately came down to the British saying, well, we at least want your, your, your government to salute us when our ships come into your port. <laughs> it, was, it was that silly. But, you know, all, all that said and done, Westphalia changed Europe for good, for the better, because you had a seed planted that, that, that really challenged the empire. And the next time it was done more perfectly was in the American Revolution. Because that's the thing, that's the thing about mankind is that we improve on our creations. You know, so Westphalia was a less perfect concept and a more perfect concept was the American independence. And that's what it says in the Constitution, towards a more perfect union, that it's up to us to make it even more perfect, because there's always challenges. 
there is an empire still. So it is our responsibility to make it more perfect. And this is something today. So what, I think people by now have, a, have an idea of Westphalia, of sovereignty, I hope. Because, I mean, I challenge people, read the whole Treaty of Westphalia, and then read the Treaty of Versailles, the Treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, the NAFTA Treaty, all these free trade imperial treaties, and you'll see the disgusting inhumanity, savageness in them. And you'll see the beauty in Westphalia, because that's a very good homework to do. And I challenge every university student, you have political, you know, students who graduate political science who never read, never really figure out Westphalia. But read the whole article. And then also read what the Russians proposed to the Ukraine, the Customs Union Board, the head of which is Sergei Glaziev, who's a close ally of Lyndon LaRouche. Read it. Read that versus what Ukraine was offered to, to uh, by Europe. But the, the, the standpoint from all of that is Westphalia, which these guys, the Russians, have mastered, which I'll show later on because they do know what Westphalia is. But you have people like George Soros, although he's not my main topic, people like George Soros, people owned by the empire, who attack sovereignty on big world forums, they're paid, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And everybody's like, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. You're so smart. But what, what is it? You want to read it? Do you want to sit here? Okay. You won't have to. I won't be in your way. Okay, go ahead. Sovereignty is an anachronistic concept originating in bygone times when society consisted of rulers and subjects, not citizens. It became the cornerstone of international relations with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The rulers of a sovereign state have a responsibility to protect the state's citizens. When they fail to do so, the responsibility is transferred to the international community. Pretty much to me. Yeah, me and my buddies. We'll take care of you. you just can't protect them. <laughs> so yeah, it's an sovereignty is an old idea. Consists, you know, from a time when you had a subjects and rulers. You know, that's not what sovereignty is. Sovereignty challenged the uh, the concept of a king and a subject. And but so this just shows the sophistry, and I'll I'll show much more of that. Yeah, it's, he's very eloquent. Yes. It's from his book. No, he's against it. He says it's an old bygone concept. It's yeah, anachronistic. It means it doesn't fit in today's times. Yeah. So it's it's not applicable to today's world anymore because. Well, see, that's, that's, that actually is interesting that Eugene said that because they write these things in a way mm -hmm. that sounds like they're actually for it and yeah. yet they're not. So even yeah. the, the thought process of trying to figure out what the heck they're yeah. talking about is a confused method yeah. to dumb down the society. Yeah. I'm for human rights. Like that's what that. he says. I'm yeah. for human rights. That's what Tony Blair says. I, yeah. I, I couldn't stand the suffering in Iraq, so I had to go there. We have to do something. Right. And that's when they show the bloody pictures of Syrians mm -hmm. and Ukrainians in the streets and, you know, pictures of the that police beating on people. When I was preparing my briefing, I mean, there are terrible p pictures of, you know, these Molotov cocktail, you know, Nazis killing the police. But I said, well, I'm not going to show that. Because people can show the other side, which you see, see on CNN and Fox News all the time. I'm going to prove it by getting people to understand the concept. And then they can see the pictures if they want. But yeah, that's how they show people, well, I, I'm for human rights. But Westphalia is not the way. You know, That's what these, your congressman says. Well, I, I, I like Glass-Steagall, but you know, we're not. Yeah. Yeah. 
can we have a reform without Glass-Steagall? I like, I like to reform the banks, but so that's how you get to them. Now I come to my main topic. <laughs> That's not a real picture. Yeah, it is. This is okay. That's a great picture. I know. It might, be real. might be real. So that's that's the main topic of discussion to counterpose sovereignty because this guy championed the move against sovereignty. Tony Blair, who, who for some reason had an epiphany before 9-11 happened, right before 9-11, that, oh, we need to get off Westphalia. You know, how did he know? I don't know. So for me, before September 11th, I was already reaching for a different philosophy in international relations from a traditional one that has held sway since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, namely, that a country's internal affairs are for it and don't interfere unless it threatens you or breaches a treaty or triggers an obligation of alliance. I did not consider Iraq fitted into this philosophy, though I could see the horrible injustice done to its people by Saddam. I know. I couldn't stand all the injustice, so I had to go in there and kill even more people. You know, Probably because Saddam wasn't killing people fast enough. And so this is really key because, you know, look at Iraq today. Look at Afghanistan today. Anybody who tells you, well, Obama got us out of Iraq and Afghanistan, have you seen what it looks like today? The reason why we're out is because there's nothing left to destroy. We did our job. Good job. Thank you so much. All the Iraqis are saying, you know, thanks, United yeah. States, for blowing, <laughs> blowing us up, putting us back 300 years. We were good enough with Saddam, but thanks anyways. But that's, you know, and, and, and so that's, that's what the empire is, and that's what people have to, be, have to be told. You can't fall for this shit anymore. And people realized it over Syria, thanks to our mobilization. All the three years of street organizing and on the Capitol Hill with Obama, Hitler, mustache clicked in. And people said, shit, this is war with Russia. This is not about Syria, because people learned their lesson in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was a big reason why Bush was thrown out. It was a big reason, actually, why people voted for Obama, because they were tired of war, and Obama promised something better. Now, one of the biggest examples which I'm going to use is this guy. He was, his name is Robert Cooper. He was a top advisor to Tony Blair. He is, his book, which is this Breaking of Nations and his other publications, they're very well read and you know, recommended reading for students who are graduating in PhD or doing postgraduate in political affairs or other, other stuff. He is uh, now, uh, he then became, uh, he works, now he works for the European Union. And he actually is a very close advisor to Catherine Ashton, who is the foreign affairs minister for from the European Union. She and her board are the ones who actually drafted the agreement, the, 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 the bill that was presented to Ukraine, the whole, the whole uh, trade bill. So he's on it. He's, he's also a member of European Council of Foreign Relations, which means he works with Ashton, which means he's involved in the whole Ukraine dialogue and so on. But, but he wrote this, he's written a lot, he wrote this, uh, the New Liberal Imperialism, which is an article in The Guardian from 2002. And he actually wrote another one recently, 16th January of this year. He said, the EU has provided us with the best Europe we've ever had. Who doesn't believe him? Bob, you don't believe him? <laughs> but you know, what is the European Union? What is, look at Greece. You know, 14 countries have death rates higher than birth rates. The European Union statistical index is recommending countries that, hey, maybe your GDP would go up if you include prostitution in your statistics. That's a lot of money, guys. You know? And I think they should include pedoph pedophilia in it, too. That's a multi-billion dollar industry. But his, now, I know, but his, I, his paper, The New Liberal Imperialism, it's nine pages. And uh, if your emails are on that sheet, I'm going to email a lot of 
stuff, background material to everybody, including this. But I'm going to read some parts of it, which are which should show you what he, what the way they think, and just how ridiculous and how stupid the thing we are. And it just shows their stupidity. So he says, in ancient world, order meant empire. Those within the empire had order, culture, and civilization. Outside the empire were barbarians, chaos, and disorder. So that's his concept of history. If you ever had anything good in the world, it was under an empire, right? So then he says, then today, you know, you have two kinds of nations. You have the pre-modern nations, which are Somalia, Afghanistan, completely decimated backward regions. And then you have postmodern nations, which is like Canada, he doesn't include the United States, like Canada, like Commonwealth, Commonwealth countries, European Union, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, etc., Singapore. And, uh, and then he says, you know, uh, and, and uh, yeah, this is really fun. And he says that the best example of a postmodern system is the European Union because it represents security through transparency and transparency through interdependence. Now, remember, this guy works for the European Union. No wonder he's going to write good things about the European Union. You know, it's like Adam Smith, when he wrote Wealth of Nations, he was working for the British Empire. He was on their payroll. Of course he's going to you know, support free trade and talk about free trade being the best thing ever. But that's what he's doing right now. And then he says, this is fun. And, and he goes through the paper that, you know, okay, how are we going to bridge the distance between postmodern and pre-modern nations? How are we going to deal with these barbarian nations? And he says, the challenge to the postmodern world is to get used to the idea of double standards. <laughs> Listen on. Among ourselves, we operate on the basis of law and open cooperative security. But when dealing with more old-fashioned kinds of states outside the postmodern continent of Europe, we need to revert to the rougher methods of an earlier era, which is, which is force, preemptive attack, deception, whatever is necessary to deal with those who still live in the 19th century world of every state for itself. Among ourselves, we keep the law, but when we are operating in the jungle, we must use the laws of the jungle. This is the advisor to you. <laughs> right. But this is the idea that you know, the, world, the world is fixed. You can't change Africa. You can't change Afghanistan. You can just go in there if you want to change something and tell, you can kill them. You can kill their leader. You can do what you want through force, preemptive attack, and deception. That's the idea of a double standard. You know, look at, look at the United States. Any, any reason that Obama says, well, we got to stop the killing and the, the, tort, the atrocity of Assad, look at Guantanamo Bay. Look at what the United States does to its own citizens. I think by those standards, we should, Obama's got to go. If the number of angry people in the streets is your, is your standard, look at all these marches we've had in Washington, D.C. Get Obama out if that's your standard. It's a good standard. So, and he says, he goes on, I think there's some more good stuff, um, you know. He basically says, you know, so how should we intervene on these nations? The most logical way to deal with chaos and the one most employed is colonialization or colonization. It is precisely because the death of imperialism that we are seeing the emergence of pre-modern world. That is, it's because we don't have a British Empire anymore that you have starvation in Africa, that you have these poor nations. I mean, the sophistry, they, they can't take care of themselves. They need somebody strong. They need an adult. They need us. You know, they need, they need, and he says that the weak still need the strong, and the strong still need an orderly world. What is needed then is a new kind of imperialism, one acceptable to a world of human rights and cosmopolitan values. And he says, he says that the postmodern European Union offers a vision of cooperative empire, a common liberty and a common security. And the paper ends. So he basically, you know, 
that's that's the British. That's an advisor to the official Tony Blair government, who now works for the EU. And I just found this out yesterday that he's actually on the board of the European Council of Foreign Relations, the head of which is Catherine Ashton, the guys who draft who want Ukraine to join the European Union, the great postmodern civilized right. empire, in their own words, you know that 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 and tells any group. Yeah, and if you don't, well. We shoot you. So that's, that's the whole Tony Blair right to protect philosophy, the whole right to protect, right to intervene philosophy. And this is also good. He said, Mr. Blair, mm -hmm. my vision for the new Labor Party is to become, as the Liberal Party was in the 19th century, a broad coalition of those who believe in progress and justice. Right. The Liberal Party. Huh? Israeli Palmerston. The guy on the left is Henry Temple or Lord Palmerston. The guy on the right is John Russell, the grandfather of Bertrand Russell. These people, because look, in, eight, in the middle of 1800s, you know, Britain had lost the war. You know, America had been created. Then Britain tried to invade again in 1812, lost. The Confederacy failed. So the British were severely weakened. Around that time, a certain movement in the oligarchy started emerging that we need to change our tactics. We need to become a, a financial empire. We need to promote liberalism, free trade. You know, that what's yours is mine, just as much. And what was formed was the Liberal Party, which was championed by these two guys. Both of them became prime ministers at one time or the other. And under both of them, what you had was the Irish potato famine, three famines in India, which killed millions of people, and a lot of other the similar atrocities. So that's Tony Blair's vision for the new Labour Party. That was the Liberal to Party, go to, to go back to that, to take the leadership that they, that they had. So, you know, and that's what... Now, the, the rest of my class is going to be to show this British Tony Blair post-Westphalian influence in Obama's government, in what we have today. Because under Tony Blair, what was formed was the NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which was, was, which was a healthcare rationing system. It was the idea of what you have under Obamacare, you know? And what you have had was like this guy, Erwin Stelzer. Uh, I forget his name. These are, well, this is something else, but uh, yeah, this is good. So what you had under, Ob under you know, um, Tony Blair's healthcare, two people are Michael Rawlings from the National, the, the NICE, and Sir Donald Berwick, who's running for governor in Massachusetts, by the way, if people don't know. <laughs> but these guys, and this is Sir Donald Berwick, an American who's running for official, I mean, that alone shouldn't disqualify him. Anybody who's knighted, you know, I don't know. Is it, is it allowed? Like, do, like I know in India, because I'm from India, Indians, we reject any knight or any, any knighthood. Because many Indians have rejected it when they're offered it. But uh, Sir Donald Berwick ch chose to do something else. But this, the NICE was created, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence was created to destroy clinical excellence, to destroy the healthcare system in Britain. Britain has the highest cancer mortality rate in Europe because their basic agenda is, well, it's not cost effective. You cost too much. The basis of that is something they described, they, they, they invented as Q-A-L-Y, quali. So this is, this is a small part of a big interview in the Time magazine, which people can, I'll, I'll send them the link, but I'll ask the question you answer. Okay. okay, why is NICE needed? Shouldn't you get the drugs you need when you are sick regardless of cost? All healthcare systems are facing the problem of finite resources and almost infinite demand. 
And all healthcare systems have implicitly, if not explicitly, adopted some form of cost control. In the US, you do it by not providing health care to some people. We are best known for looking at a new drug, device, or diagnostic technique to see whether the increment in the cost of that treatment is worth the increment in the health gain. How is that measured? It's based on the cost of a measure called a quality adjusted life year. A quality scores your health on a scale from zero to one. Zero if you're dead, <laughs> and one if you're in perfect health. You find out as a result of a treatment where a patient would move up the scale. If you do a hip replacement, the patient might start at 0.5 and go up to 0.7, improving by 0.2. You can assume patients live for an average of 15 years following hip replacements. And 0.2, time, and 0.2 times 15 equals three quality adjusted life years. If the hip replacement costs 10,000 GBP? British pounds. Oh, and uh, about $15,000 to do, it's 10,000 divided by three, which equals three 1,333 GBP, about $5,000. That figure is the cost per quality. Right. Well, I mean, there's just so many problems in this because how do you determine somebody's in perfect health? What determines perfect health? You know? The second is, what determines the cost of a treatment? Is it the disease itself? Because any cost in healthcare is determined by the economy. It's determined by the system overall, because your ultimate measure is the dollar. Your ultimate measure is, well, what determines the value of the dollar? Which is today completely arbitrary, which is based on derivatives. So instead of changing the economic system, when you have bankers and the government saying, well, we got we to gotta ration health care because it's too expensive, that's when you get the Hitler mustache, which is completely valid because they know what they're talking about is bullshit. And any doctor who will tell you quality is bullshit because you cannot tell when somebody's in perfect health. And plus, even if, even if the person is living six months more or a year more, you can never tell how long somebody's gonna live. How can you take a wild guess that, oh, per we assume somebody's gonna live 15 years after a hip replacement? No, you cannot. Nobody can. So. Right. <laughs> right. 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 So these are the people who designed Obamacare. Right. What's the guy's name again? The second one? Sir Donald Berwick. 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 What's he running for? He's running for the governor of Massachusetts. Massachusetts? Yes. And who knew that Tony Blair is also on the he's also an advisor to JP Morgan? Yeah, he's paid like a million dollars a year to be an advisor to J.P. Morgan. And he was one of the first people who defended the bankers and praised Margaret Thatcher, right? Now, coming to, well, I won't go through this, you know. If I had to write a book, if I had to write a book on Susan Rice, Samantha Powers, Victoria Newland, Valerie Jarrett and Obama, I would call it Fifty Shades of Genocide. This is, this, this is a, you, have people read the Fifty Shades of Grey? It's a very popular, I've heard of it too. It's very popular, popular fiction if you go into Barnes and Nobles and other bookstores. I haven't read it, but it's a gist of a very rich banker having an affair with a very young woman, which is completely sadistic and masochistic and brutal and it's pretty it's it's pretty disgusting liberal porn but and but this is what you know this is what these people gain sadistic pleasure of blowing blowing other nations so that's what i would call but this is something really good because especially susan rice she played she has played a very important role in obama's administration in pushing foreign wars and Susan Rice comes directly out of Oxford. She was taught, she, she, was, she was a student there. And she, 
she was a she was a, a student of this guy sir alan roberts i think that's his name hold on a second adam yeah sir adam roberts this guy on the top left and uh, one of his students is susan rice and one of his other students is the guy on the bottom which is timothy garden ash and this guy, Ash, uh, they both have written a book, Civil Resistance in Power Politics. But they basically had a think tank in, uh, out of Oxford called, uh, what is it called? Project Democracy. And, uh, and one of the other think tanks very closely related to them is the National Endowment for Democracy, the <coughs> NED think tank. The think tank which Helga intervened on two days ago. In, in Washington, D.C. These are the think tanks which were created in, after the Bretton Woods takedown in 1970s and were created to, I mean, if you read his book and what you see in uh, Libya, what you saw, these colored revolutions, you know, uh, the orange revolution in Ukraine, the, the, the revo in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, it's like, it's like word to word. It's like what well, these people are, and many people who are leading this will tell you, well, we have been, we were advised by, by foreign governments to follow this blueprint. But Susan Rice is one of their students who actually runs Obama's administration, who's a very important part of it. So is this guy, McFall, on the top left. He is also from Oxford, studied in Oxford for, on the same scholarship, the Rhodes Scholarship. Because the Rhodes Scholarship was created by Cecil Rhodes, who was an evil British bastard or who oversaw a lot of mass killing in Africa. He basically had the concept to, to rename Africa Rhodesia after him and to fill it up with, with the white population, a superior race. That's what he called it. Anyway, so he created a scholarship where they would, and, and the, the funding would come from the Rothschilds. So these people, the people that are on Rhodes Scholarship are, are people who are specifically handpicked and groomed to, be, to, to do the bidding of imp British liberal imperialism policies. So, and the biggest, e biggest examples are McFall, Susan Rice. But there's an, you know, like uh, every rule has an exception. There's another Rhodes Scholar who's not evil is Bill Clinton, who actually went to Britain and actually through his stay there developed a very genuine and American hatred of the British, partly because of the way they treated him because he's not nobility. He's actually white trash, what people would call, you know. His, his background is entirely that, yeah. So he, like Roosevelt, anyways, that's a whole different story. But Susan Rice, Samantha Powers, who replaced Susan Rice uh, and, and, and actually uh, heads the right to protect policy of Obama. She, she and her husband, Cass Sunstein, anybody knows who Cass Sunstein was? He was an Obama's uh, advisor, very top advisor. He wrote papers in 2000. He's out of Harvard. He's a Harvard professor. He wrote papers that we should, anybody who is a conspiracy theorist, anybody who disagrees with the official light, anybody who thinks 9-11 is an inside job, should be taxed or brainwashed. We should reprogram them. And if peop people don't know that, OK, that, I'm going to show a very good video. There we go. Okay, this is worth. Yeah. This is him being confronted. Excuse the ad. <laughs> My name is Bill Deberg from Bill Deberg. Foreign <laughs> <laughs> College. And I know you wrote many articles, but I think the most telling one about you is the 2008 one called Conspiracy Theories. 
where he openly advocated government agents and infiltrated activist groups of not love truth and also stifled dissent online. I was wondering why do you think it's the government's job or why do you think the government should uh, go after family members who have questions about 9-11, responders who are lied to about the air, survivors, survivors whose testimony commits, and also government whistleblowers that were gagged because they released information that contradicts the official story. Why do you think the government should do that? I think, as, as Ricky said, I've read hundreds of articles, and I remember some and not others. Uh, I don't know I remember very well. I didn't say that. Um, but whatever was said in that article, my role in government is um, to oversee the federal rulemaking in a way that is uh, uh, wholly disconnected from the vast majority of my academic writing, including that. So, and then I'm just asking because you may be the next Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't write those things, and that's why I'm bring them up to you. So, and, and all I can say is that there are a lot of things that I've written, I've written I guess, and there are even more things I've said to have written. And, uh, uh, he can't answer. I agree with some of the things I've written, but I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> <laughs> I focus on the, the, what my boss wants me to do. <laughs> Is it safe to say that you retract saying that conspiracy theory should be banned or taxed for having an opinion online? Is it safe to say I remember that? that? I don't remember the article very well, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hope I didn't say either of those things. But it, you did, and, I, and it's written. Do you retract them? I'm focused on my job. So you're not retracting them. Do you still believe that? I, 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 Do you I, still I, believe I, that? There's no, people should have freedom of speech. Thank you. So, 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 I can, I can go on the record. He's the man who wrote about it. So, so yeah, it's a good video. And that's who Cass Sunstein is. He's no longer in Obama's, because he was just too much political baggage. And the, uh, this video came out, the papers came out, and it didn't hit the mainstream media like it should have. Oh, my God. But he had to go. So... This is, I mean, you know, coming back to today, this is what the empire is. It's completely double standard sophistry. Like this guy, McFall, you know, he basically, when he was put in as ambassador to Russia, he comes from this total evil background. He was put in there to make sure Putin is not reelected. He was put in there in 2011, very, you know, months ahead of Putin's, the, the Russian elections. And he basically said himself that, you know, he said most Russian watchers are diplomats or specialists on security or Russian culture. I am neither. I am a specialist in democracy, anti-dictatorial movements and revolutions. And he said, you know, he's talking about Ukraine. He's talking about the government interventions there. And he says, uh, does this kind of intervention violate international law? Not anymore. You know, he says, uh, there was a time when championing state sovereignty was a progressive idea. But today, those who revere the sovereignty of the state above all else often do so to preserve autocracy, while those who champion the sovereignty of the people are the new progressives. Because they, they call themselves the champion of the people. People sovereignty versus the state sovereignty. Assad versus Syria, Yanukovych versus Ukraine, Putin versus Russians. It's total sophism because the only real fight has been between Zeus and Prometheus. That's it. You may have like in Westphalia, the treaty, these people were not best buddies. You think the founding fathers were best buddies? They were totally opposing. But they knew they, it's them versus the empire. That's, that's the fundamental difference. So now you've you know, this is one of our beautiful EIRs, Peace of Westphalia or World War III. It's in 2006 when we were going for the OASIS plan and stuff. So LaRouche knows what he's talking about. He's been organizing Asia, Russia, China, India, a lot of circles in the United States and Europe on this. And so, oh yeah, Dick Cheney in his biography 
said that his only regret is he didn't kill more Syrians. You know, he, this is from his biography. <laughs> Cheney's memoir, In My Time, it sounds as excruciating as you might imagine. No apologies, no regrets, plenty of self-satisfied machismo. If Cheney had it, to do, had it all to do over again, the only thing he'd do differently is bomb the shit out of Syria. Here's a rundown of the highlights. In June 2007, Cheney urged <coughs> George W. Bush to bomb a suspected nuclear reactor in Syria. Quote, I again made the case for U.S. military action against the reactor, Mr. Cheney wrote about a meeting on the issue. But I was a lone voice. After I finished, the president asked, does anyone here agree with the vice president? Not a single hand went up around the room. The Israelis eventually took it out. He tried to get Colin Powell fired after 2004 for insufficiently supporting the war in Iraq. His resignation in January 2005, Cheney says, was for the best. He repeatedly offered his resignation to Bush on account of his being the most hated God. figure in national politics and feared being a drag on Bush's re-election ticket. He also kept a signed, post-dated resignation letter in his man-sized office safe to be opened on the occasion of a debilitating heart attack, stroke, or reclamation <laughs> to Hades. <laughs> Cheney claims that then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, then Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, Representative Jane Harmon, and Senator Jay Rockefeller, all Democrats, unanimously approved of the administration's illegal, warrantless wiretapping program and agreed that the full Congress should be kept in the dark about it. Unsurprisingly, he thought the Iraq war went swimmingly. <laughs> While recovering from heart surgery in 2010, he was unconscious for several weeks during which he had a prolonged, vivid dream that he was living in an Italian villa, pacing the stone paths to get coffee and newspapers. Wasn't that an episode of The Sopranos? <laughs> so, I mean, there's really no difference between Cheney's policies and what Obama's doing. You know, these neocons wanted to bomb the shit out of Syria, which Obama almost did, right? Now, you've had presidents, you've had people in the American presidents among the vast majority of horseshit, you've had some real patriots, like FDR, who knew what sovereignty is, who knew what human value is. And this is really good. You have to do some more reading? Okay, yeah. How much? 15 minutes? No. Not even that? No, no. We have to be out of here at five. So oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a beautiful excerpt from FDR's book, which is uh, As He Saw It, which is on Bob Wesser's website if people want to download it. <laughs> right? I'll end it. It's basically a make, you know, that's the god of Saturn eating his own children. That's the empire we have today. That's Zeus. That's the empire which is just kill, kill, kill. I mean, it's a really important polemic because he's, he's eating up his children. There's nothing left. You're killing your own future. That's how an empire survives. Well, it survives by killing, it, eating itself out, right? Yeah. That's what you have today. That's the British Empire. So my point is to make people very clear, you know. I organize out of Canada, mostly. And uh, what I said in the beginning was that you have the rest of the world is looking to the United States for action and leadership. On understanding what's at stake is the idea of human, uh, idea of sovereignty. The problem is you, it takes a sovereign person to defend a sovereign nation. And what you have is, that's, that's the fight is to change the, 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 you have to challenge the intellect of the people. That's what's gonna cause the revolution. You need a leadership, and you want to change their intellect. That's, that, those are the words of LaRouche, actually, from last week, I think, was a discussion with, with the internal members. Um, I end my class. Any questions? You raised your hand. So, it's all under what the king's policy was. From the past, the past four years or so, what's the Obama policy? Mm-hmm. The world's population rapidly from Yeah. Yeah. What's your question about it? Yeah, well, that's what you had in Westphalia. The, six, the 30 years war, the European population was 50% less. It was, it was completely decimated. All of Europe was dead. If it wasn't for Colbert, 
you know, it was under Colbert that a lot of Canada and North America was, you know, uh, populated. A lot of French Canada, Quebec, is because of Colbert's reforms where he would encourage shiploads of people, no, just go and colonize, build something there. We wouldn't have a North America if it wasn't for Colbert. Yes. wanted to go through a lot but because of time I'm gonna send out the PowerPoint and a lot of follow-up material uh, for my class any other questions well you already have a lot of international like, treaties that should be defended the United Nations Charter, the, the charter that Russia and the United States signed in 1994, I think called the Budapest uh, Agreement, which, which uh, binds America and Russia to protect the sovereignty of Ukraine and the surrounding regions. There, there are a lot of treaties but that, that already exist that can be upheld, and that's what Russia is saying. Because, and, and the Constitution is based on Westphalia. The Constitution says any president who wishes to take us to war has to go through Congress. And if Obama does it, there is no war. No way they can start World War III without the United States. They need American thermonuclear arsenal. They're not going to do it with Israel. You know? The British are not going to risk their necks. They're too smart for that. But you have Americans who are too stupid who might go along. All of the staff comes from Oxford. All of them are, all the neocons actually even, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, they come from think tanks which were created by London. And the EIR, the LaRouche Pub, is filled with extensive work that nobody else has done. Yes? Uh, well, when President Obama said in the State of the Union address that he wanted to bypass Congress congressional approval yeah on certain things or measures, yeah. what exactly did he have in mind? He, he knows that he, he cannot declare war against the country without the approval of Congress, but can he take... But like, he's going to do it like, because... Well, uh, I mean, can he take like minor measures? Like no, he's not going to take any minor measures. Somewhere Look, to, no, no, no. You know, that he doesn't need no, to you're not going to have any troops. The World War III is, is going to be a two-minute war. And in the words of John F. Kennedy, the living are going to envy the dead. That's what's going to happen. Obama's not going to take any minor measures. This guy is a maniac who's going to destroy the United States because that's a Nero. He's a Nero. Remember that? The fundamental psychosis, he's a Nero. When, Nero put, when Hitler put his gun to his head, it's not all pity me, I'm dying, it's, it's, it's a revenge against the world. What, when Nero killed himself, he said, I'm, you're, I'm too good for you. I'm going to punish you by killing myself. That's what Obama's going to do. He's going to blow the world up because he says, well, you disappointed me. Shame on you. Shame on you for not recognizing how awesome I am. I'm the best thing that, better than Jesus. He really thinks that. This guy is psychotic, which is an extra that, along with the whole financial system collapsing, everyone here should call their congressman on Monday. OK. Hello. My name is Avni. I'm a full-time uh, member of the LaRouche organization in Canada, out of Montreal, where our headquarters are. And uh, I'm going to go through something very important a very important milestone in mankind's history, which was the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. And why this basically established an idea, a concept of a nation, of a country, for the first time, somewhat effectually, before the American Revolution finally realized it more fully, 
But this, this idea of a sovereign nation and of a sovereign nation being responsible for its own actions was not violated so openly till, till now, till you saw Libya, Syria, so on. So blatant violation of it. The problem was that when, when this violation occurred, very few people around the world, very few leaders understood that why this is such a big deal. Why is it that when Tony Blair attacked Westphalia in 1990s, like a year before 9-11, what's the big deal? Okay, so we need a global community. But, and it was only LaRouche, it was only our organization that really understood what's being attacked here. And that's what I'm gonna go through my class, is what, what was Westphalia? Because the, John F. Kennedy, in one of his televised speeches, said at one point that you know we have the opportunity of becoming the best nation the, the best generation or the last generation and this is not i mean this is this is this is jfk this is not larouche although larouche is the only one ever since who has said that now w the best generation means that you that you take on the mission for humanity you are responsible for giving your nation your humanity a real mission and the problem today is a lot of people don't think that way. You know, when, when the Dow goes down 0.5%, it's national headlines. But the fact that 9,000 children starve in sub-Sahara Africa every day, half a million children starve or, or they die in India every year, this is not national headlines. You don't have people cringe to that. You don't have, oh my God, that's terrible, we should do something. Now why do these half a million children die? Because there's no soap. They lack soap. So how are you going to change the situation? Are you going to give them soap? No, you need to improve the edu you need to improve the culture, the whole economic infrastructure. You need to increase the relative population per density, what LaRouche talks about. That's how you change the paradigm right now. That's, that's the mission right now which we have adopted, which, which is the basis of our movement in the United States, Canada, and 20 different nations around the world. This is what we do. And right now, our, right now, the eyes of the world are on the United States. What are you going to do? We don't have any food, and, but that's not what happened, because that would have happened much earlier. Because these, although they're called the 30 years war, they, were, they had been going on in one for fashion or the other since about 100 years. Just like you can say, World War I never really ended. I mean, except for a decade here or a few years here, the world has been con continuously at war ever since the past 100 years. And that's exactly what you had in 1500s till 1600s. And so you had, but, but with, the, with, the, with the Treaty of Westphalia, what, what came before was, you know, you had, you had villages which were completely decimated of population. You had, like this is, this is you know, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France, and all the red and purple areas are population areas where the population dropped 50%. And the rest of the areas are much less. In many of these regions all over Europe, it took the, these villages about 100 years to get their population back up to their original levels, pre-Westphalian levels. And so you had many of these villages where you wouldn't find any men, only women and babies. You know? and, and it's not just people were dying in battle. That's not where, that's, that, that's the funny thing because people weren't just, it wasn't just because people are dying fighting each other. You had a complete collapse of civilization because when all the men are fighting, who's gonna grow the crops? Who's gonna cultivate? Who's gonna tend to the farms? Who's gonna, you know, cause you need to continuously build a civilization, roads, agriculture, shipping, all that. None of that was happening. So you had people who died of plague, diseases, and just neglect. Infant mortality rate was through the roof. One in your 20 children survived on average. That's what's happening today. That's the United States mortality rate for women. If you look at the, the red areas are the, the regions where more women are dying than you know, the mortality rate of the death rate among women is increasing, often through birth, you know, uh, giving birth and, or, or after birth and so on and so forth. But this, this is, this is 1600s. This, but this is the present in the United States. 
So, so the point was you had you had in Europe emerge a, a strong, very small, but a very intellectually strong force against this crap. And one of the people who who led it was this guy, Mazarin. He was a cardinal. So he was a priest, you know, much like Cusa, who was also in the church. But these guys weren't just praying. These guys were actually politically active. They were actually organizing a leadership across Europe to get away from the Dark Age and to create an alliance based on progress. So what are the Americans going to do? Do they realize what's at stake? And do they realize they have the power to change the situation? And I can tell you, every, every, every thinking person in the world is looking to the United States to act. This is a very big responsibility. And I hope my class helps you understand why we have the authority. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not something that cannot be done. It has been done. And this is actually something the United States used to do. Not, under, not just under John F. Kennedy, but way back even the founding, you know, the founding fathers, but then especially under John Quincy Adams, which LaRouche called last week the golden age of America. Because under John Quincy Adams, not as president, but under Monroe, what he drafted pretty much was the Monroe Doctrine, was an idea that we are gonna, we're gonna take responsibility for the development of South American nations and colonies. You may be a colony, but we're, we're gonna ensure that you are, you are treated fairly as a human being, as a sovereign culture. So we're gonna prevent the British Empire from looting you, from raping, from, your, your, your resources and so on. That, in, in very broad brush strokes, was the Monroe Doctrine. And, uh, but this idea, this, the concept of a nation, of protecting a nation, of that of the general welfare being more important than profit, this, was, this did, did not just come from John Quincy Adams' mind or the Founding Fathers' mind. This, this came from Europe. This came from the Treaty of Westphalia. And even before that, this came from Cusa, which I'll go in later. But this is very important because, you know, if you look at the Nuremberg uh, tribunals, when the Nazis were tried, they, they were tried for war crimes and other crimes, killing the Jews was like number four or five, not higher than that. The number one crime was invasion of other nations, of violating international treaty, violating the nation's uh, sovereignty, that was a number one issue. That, that, that's because that as a principle is much more important. And that's why when you meet any liberal idiot on the street who says, well, I don't see Obama killing Jews, you know, tell them what, what, well, that's not exactly what we tried the Nazis for actually. That was not the number one criteria. The number one criteria is violating the general welfare, violating human rights, that's it. That's what, that's what the United States has been doing over the past decade. Okay, so, so we come to the 30 years war, you know, because the, the problem today is that the Treaty of Westphalia is called as, if you, if you study it in universities, it's, called, it's taught as the, treat, the, the peace of exhaustion. That everybody just got exhausted of fighting for decades and they said, well, can't we just find a way to get along? You know, I don't have any army anymore and we don't. Thirty Years' War, which had drowned Europe in blood and battles over religion, defined principles of and quality in numerous subcontracts. Is there a word missing? Oh, s principles of sovereignty. Oh. Sorry. <clears throat> so the treaty defined principles of sovereignty and equality in numerous subcontracts, and in this way it became the constitution of the new system of states in Europe. We quote the two key principles. Article 1 begins, a Christian general and permanent peace and true and honest friendship must rule between the holy imperial majesty and the holy all Christian majesty, as well as between all and every ally and follower of the mentioned imperial majesty, the House of Austria, and successors. And this peace must be so honest and seriously guarded and nourished 
that each part furthers the advantage, honor, and benefit of the other. A faithful neighborliness should be renewed and flourish for peace and friendship and flourish again. Peace among sovereign nations requires, in other words, according to this principle, that each nation develops itself fully and regards it as its self-interest to develop the others fully and vice versa. A real family of nations. Right. So your advantage lies in the advantage of the other. You have to see the challenge of seeing yourself in, in another person, in your enemy. You know, seeing a human being in a Nazi, it's not the easiest thing, but it's there somewhere. But, but that was the idea that you are your own worst enemy. That if you want to fight real, real evil in, in the world, it's not going to be by killing another human being. It has, you have to seek the advantage of the other to kill an evil. It's a pretty, high, it's a pretty hard concept. But you want to keep reading Article 2? Sure. Article 2 says, on both sides, all should be forever forgotten and forgiven. What has from the beginning of the unrest, no matter how or where, from one side or the other, happened in terms of hostility, so that neither because of that nor for any other reason or pretext should anyone commit or allow to happen any hostility, unfriendliness, difficulty, or obstacle in respect to persons, their status, goods, or security itself, or through others, secretly or openly, directly or indirectly, under the pretense of the authority of the law, or by way of violence within the kingdom, or anywhere outside of it. And any earlier contradictory treaties should not stand against this. Instead, the fact that each and every one, from one side and the other, both before and during the war, committed insults, violent acts, hostilities, damages, and injuries, without regard to persons or outcomes, should be completely put aside, so that everything, what well, there, The two of the main people who led the whole thing was Mazarin and this young guy, uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Colbert was a very prominent figure, and they were in France, they were out of Paris. And they, like Mazarin was the tutor of Louis XIV, who was at that time, like, he, he basically started tutoring the, the emperor since he was a child. The emperor wasn't that sharp, but because he was under strong guide, guidance and a strong leadership, you know, he took, France took on the role of pushing the Treaty of Westphalia. And this is something which culminated, you know, in 1648, where many of the opposing forces came together and signed the treaty. And, but, but this wasn't just, you know, one day affair. Because the, the, the collaboration and the dialogue had begun for about a decade before. But what were they talking about? They were talking about this guy, Cusa, the real precursor to the Renaissance, the real precursor to the idea of, this idea of, you know, of, build, of having a nation without the divine right of kings, that you can have a republic, that, you, that, that the idea that every man is created in the image of God. And he wrote many books on learned, learned ignorance and so on and so forth. And these books weren't just nice books, they were being discussed by the topmost intellectuals in Europe, forcing them to change their identity, forcing them to realize that, you know, that, yeah, that this actually makes sense that the idea of a man created in the image of God is actually a very, very important concept in changing anything. But what does that mean? You know, that doesn't mean you know, Jesus walks on water, so you walk on water. It's, it's not superpowers. Man is created in the image of God through the mind, through his thinking, that through his thought he can actually change the universe. He can actually change his surrounding nature. So who's asked? Writings were very important, and what was so, you know, I mean, there was no mass communication. So if you want to have a dialogue, if you want to, you know, uh, Mazarin was sending people all over Europe. Uh, so, and, and in an age without mass communication, it was, uh, it was quite work, because it took a month to get a letter anywhere. And then it took another month to get the letter back. In the meantime, your horse may may get tired or your horsemen may get shot and so on and so forth. I mean, this was quite a tedious affair, but they still did it. And in 1648, you had the signing of a treaty 
of the treaty, which meant, which, had, which is actually, we're going to read two articles from it. Who wants to read? Uh, up top or is it article one? From the top. The Treaty of Westphalia 